Hi, I'm Samantha Yap and I help blockchain and cryptocurrency companies tell their stories. I'm really passionate about demystifying emerging technologies and making it easy to understand for everyone. So follow me on this journey as we discover the history of money to better understand where money is heading today. In this series, we'll explore why Bitcoin, digital currencies and decentralized finance may play an important role in our future. You're about to watch my full-length conversation with today's guest as we explore a topic on the story of money. This conversation forms the basis of this week's episode linked below. Come join me on the story of money by Avcast. I'm very excited to be joined by Sam Kazmian uh, from Frax Finance. Sam, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here, Samantha. Thanks for inviting me. No worries. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Sam. What, what's your background? Tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, so basically I, uh, I got into cryptocurrency like a long time ago now, actually 2013. Uh, I heard about it while I was in college in uh, UCLA. And it's actually funny now is one of the first cryptocurrencies I started mining was Dogecoin. Uh, back really? In, back in wow. Yeah, in, in uh, early 2014-ish. And um, yeah, it's pretty crazy how, how far Doge has come since then. Um, but basically after college, I started my first company uh, called Everpedia, which is kind of like the decentralized uh, Wikipedia. But uh, what my interest in crypto really uh, are about is uh, the aspect of cryptocurrency as money and what um, money actually means and, and where the evolution of crypto uh, as money actually is going to go. So in 2019, I started Frax, uh, which is a uh, algorithmic stablecoin. It's actually the first uh, fractional stablecoin is basically what we call it. Um, and currently working on that full time. And uh, it's been really fun. Awesome. Um, do you still have Doge, a lot of Dogecoin? <laughs> Um, I, I have more than, more than, uh, enough, thankfully, but realistically I did accidentally at this point, uh, sell a lot of it in the first, uh, you know, bull market, just trading and, and doing other stuff. So I am kind of like the, you know, you know, the Bitcoin pizza guy, the guy that makes fun of, yes. uh, everyone makes fun of every year. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like the Doge, uh, pizza guy kind of. Oh, uh, I didn't no. buy any pizzas, but uh, I would have uh, probably done better if I just uh, never touched it. So now a lot of the cryptocurrencies that I have, I just I just don't even bother touching because I'm just like, I don't want to pull a doge on this one, you know? Yeah, yeah. Wait, just for our listeners, um, uh, the first Bitcoin transaction was a guy buying pizzas with Bitcoin. Uh, how, how much Bitcoin was it? It was 10,000 yeah. uh, Bitcoins, so 10,000 points. Yeah, and so every year there's a Bitcoin pizza day and, um, you know, people calculate what the price of Bitcoin is <laughs> that day and then, you know, remind this pizza guy <laughs> or, or not the pizza guy, the guy who bought the pizzas. <laughs> it's actually a really good way to kind of start this just as an aside and I guess we, we can get to it. But yeah. the thing is, like, think about how, how weird that is, right? It's like uh, that, that always gets me thinking is like, you know, you call these things cryptocurrencies, right? The, the word currency is in it. And and everyone always says like, you know, uh, everything is going to be denominated in, in Bitcoin and stuff. Yet we kind of have a national, like Bitcoin national holiday, so to speak, uh, every year where we're like, wow, that was the most expensive uh, pizza in, in the world, right? And, you know, it's just I just find it kind of funny because that's not the best way that you get people to want to spend uh you know bitcoin because everywhere people go it's like what do you think that guy is feeling i right? like wow like I, his name is laszlo by the way I think. yeah and like it's like are you like thinking like laszlo will never like uh forgive himself or blah 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 and i actually think that guy has, has so much btc he's like one of the earliest uh devs and, and stuff on it but um it's just kind of weird right it's like right it's it's just and then you yeah yeah no it, it's it's a good point because we're going to touch into that um a bit later but you know that's actually again one of the first transactions or maybe the most famous one um where the pizza was denominated in bitcoins um and just back then it happened to be 10,000 bitcoins but perhaps today it you know, be 0 0.0001 or something <laughs> of a Bitcoin. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll jump into that in a little bit. But let's start with um, 
Who decides what money is worth today? Yeah, that's a well. That's a very open-ended and philosophical question, a little bit, right? I mean, all of our money, right? In fact, pretty much, if you look at statistics, eighty percent of the world's uh, trade is denominated in dollars. The, the money today is predominantly U.S. dollars, right? And one of the first things people, you know, either don't know about or, or kind of don't realize is that the dollar is a floating currency. It's not actually like hard pegged to something like gold or or like silver or any any commodity. The question is, who decides how much dollars are worth? Well, we know that the U.S. government tries, at least its intent or it's what it says is that it the dollar loosely tracks this uh, CPI, right? And and so plus minus some percent inflation that they target per year. Uh, Sorry, what's to, CPI? What does CPI stand for and what is it? Yeah, so that's the that's the consumer price index, which is mm-hmm. essentially uh, a basket of goods that the U.S. government actually upkeeps uh, in calculating, which is defined as people's uh, essentially standard of living, um, right? And so the things in the CPI are things like the average price of like cars or automobiles in the U.S., uh, food items such as bread, uh, milk and eggs, um, the average price of rent. I, there's, a, there's a few other stuff, you know, electronics. Um, I forget off the top of my head, but um, there's obviously debate about what should go into this basket and, and what shouldn't. So, for example, the cost of college tuition is not in the CPI, right? Um, some people say it should be because it's the, you know, it's kind of the quintessential thing that uh, American standard of living is uh, required, right? Like it, it's part of American life. Um, and so that's one of the main things I, I feel like people kind of gloss over is that the dollar does loosely track something, particularly this basket of goods. And the reason it's some, some basket of goods versus another, and it's not like gold or something, is because the idea behind it is that the dollar should be able to always buy that basket of goods because that's the definition of what it is to live some kind of standard of living, some base uh, needs, right? And then by the definition of the government, right? And most people forget that or they don't know that or they they don't actually, you know, you you hear all of these things where it's like, um, oh, the, the dollar is like hyperinflating or like they just keep printing more or like they do it this and that. Um, and that's true, right? But then the main thing that, that you have to keep keep in mind is every single uh, quarter and, and every single year, uh, the Federal Reserve releases their, their CPI target, which means how good or how well is the dollar actually following the basket of goods that that the actual federal government is is trying to loosely peg the currency to. People don't don't even talk about that. So that, that's kind of interesting that you know um, people just kind of miss miss or gloss over it. Um, but that's one of the most important things of the dollar, right? It's like mm-hmm. it's supposed to provide a somewhat stable and you know consistent standard of living for uh, the average American citizen uh, in, in their consumer life. Right. That's actually the point. Right. So you've talked a lot about, I guess, because you're in the U.S. and, you know, you've, you've talked about how the U.S. dollar and how they kind of decide what money is worth. Um, but, you know, for, for our listeners around the world, um, you know, do they, I mean, do the do other countries, uh, have a similar thing? Does it differ depending on what country you're in? You know, I, I guess it's other national currencies. I mean, I'm in London or I'm in the UK, so it's by the British pound. So I'm sure there's another um, a, a system here. Um, you know, if you were to, to kind of explain how the world right now decides what money is worth, could you could you give me one? Well, it's a really open-ended question. I, I think so. So different different national uh, currencies have different uh, goals, right? So some some countries actually peg their national currency to the U.S. dollar. Essentially, what they're saying is we try to make our legal tender uh, 
the value of the U.S. dollar because we actually trust the U.S. government to essentially conduct monetary policy, right? And in order, like they basically trust the U.S. government that the, those uh, the dollar is not going to be worthless. It's actually going to track a fairly consistent standard of living. Um, other countries, namely things like Japan, I believe uh, the U.K. is one of them. They just float uh, loosely their their national currency to. to some target like a CPI or, or other kinds of target uh, things that's not another country's national currency. So they actually have their own sovereign monetary policy, so to speak. Um, and essentially, uh, there's just many, many different kinds of national objectives. But like I said originally, right, if you, you know, I'm not an economist by trade but, you know, or, or anything like that, but just looking at statistics, 80% of the, the world's uh, trade and settlement value is denominated in USD. So just overall during the present day, uh, essentially it's it's the dollar's world and we, we all kind of denominated it, so to speak. Yeah, you're right. And and we'll get into denomination in a, in a little bit. But um, how does, I mean, whether it be the US government or just, you know, uh, uh, other countries or us as a world, how do we know how much money there is? Uh, it seems like there's no, um, like, you know, no number and no end or cap to how much money there is in the world. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so there's like, yeah, I mean, it, it's really difficult concept, right? Cause it's almost like, uh, there, and there's a lot of views about this, right? It's like when you go and you deposit a thousand dollars in a bank, right? And and the bank tells you you have a thousand dollars, right? And I can like wire it to you, right? But you know that the bank is going and lending your one thousand dollars to someone else in a loan, right? To either buy a house or something else, right? So like, you know, was there a thousand dollars created out of thin air? Because now you have a thousand dollars it like it says right in a bank to to wire you know to me and you and then they take your thousand and they go do other stuff with it, right so is that money creation right and, and so those are actually important topics in, in uh uh economics that that there's a lot of views about where one of the views is actually that this is how the majority of money is created it's yes indeed this this actual thing we just described the money supply in the situation did dump. That, that's one view uh, of, of uh, thinking about it. And, and then the other view is that essentially um, that there's only a uh, hard supply of money, the M1 stock that the, that the sovereign government can actually print. And then they actually just lend this out and the actual amount of money is just the total circulating supply of dollars. So, I mean, uh, it's a really interesting topic and it kind of gets into it with cryptocurrency because like there's a lot of applications in crypto that, you know, uh, allow you to these days lend and borrow and it actually expands the actual, you know, credit supply of, of, of something. So it's a, it's a really interesting topic to explore. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, again, for our, for our listeners, um, like you said, if, if we're if I'm sending kind of one thousand dollars to you from my bank account, it's just it's like it for us. It's literally digits on our on our bank account on a balance sheet. Yeah, credit actually, creation, right? It's like yeah. yeah, banks are in the in the business of of creating credit, and credit is a kind of money. It's just like what exactly do you define as as money? Is it the M one or M two supply combined? Or yeah, yeah. Um, and and before we touch on cryptocurrency. What is currency? Oh, now it's even it's even more uh, open ended, right? Well, one of the main things. Uh, okay, so the reason I kind of always start with like the CPI and actually like what the dollar tracks and, and stuff is that we we use dollars as a currency, right? So so like we no one debates that the dollar is or isn't currency, right? And what's actually interesting is. I always like to say that cryptocurrency as like a complete umbrella term for all of these tokens and coins is, is the biggest misnomer that's, that's uh, you know, confused a lot of people 
uh, for a long time because my definition of currency is something that's meant to keep your standard of living stable. That's my personal definition because that's what the dollar's intent is. We can we can debate about how good of a job it's doing or not, right? That that's up for debate, right? Whether it's inflating too much or not or, or whatever. But the dollar is the most predominant currency in the world. It's intent. Uh, whether it's accomplishing it or not, is to keep your standard of living uh, the same, which follows the consumer price index, right? And one, one thing that's interesting is notice how that's kind of like the exact opposite definition of an investment, right? Like if, if you make a good investment, the whole point is your standard of living is supposed to go up, right? Like the, the whole point is you invest in something and you make a lot of money, right? That's, that's what is usually mm -hmm. said, right? So the point is you allocate your currency to something that will hopefully change your standard of living, right? And then you exit that investment for money, currency. Um, and then that currency's thing is supposed to keep your standard of living constant, right? It's essentially, it's the reference point for how we basically um, kind of calculate and do our accounting into the future, right? You can know that, you know, a, a gallon of milk is about, you know, four US dollars, plus or minus the, the average yearly inflation target, give or take, right, that the government makes uh, public. So like you can know that a car, you know, the average, you know, family vehicle in the US is, is this price and plus or minus, you know, 2.5% inflation, which is the target of uh, the Federal Reserve, right? And so, one of the first things I always say when talking about cryptocurrency is like it shouldn't have been called currency because it just it, it's a misnomer and uh, it, they're really good investments. Obviously, not financial advice, right? Not saying go out and buy all the Dogecoin or, or anything, but the fact of the matter is, whenever someone tells you to go and, and buy some cryptocurrency, it's not to keep your standard of living the same, right? It's because they're like, right. do this, and you're going to hopefully get rich, right? No, I, I really like um, the point you make about how currency, well, to you, but I think to a lot of people, I think it makes sense for me that it's meant to be stable or keep our living stable. And uh, it's interesting because, um, you know, yeah, you made a point, a lot of the uh, world's transactions and trade today um, is denominated in U.S. dollars, even when you travel, because, you know, um, I was born in Malaysia, I, tra I, I lived and traveled uh, a bit throughout Southeast Asia, and every time you uh, measure kind of how well the currency, for example, in, in the Indonesian rupiah is doing, or the Malaysian ringgit is doing, it, it is denominated in U.S. dollars. It's like, one ringgit is this U.S. dollars. It's like, that's kind of how it is reported on and measured. Um, so that's that's definitely, um, you know, interesting that I, I wondered, I mean, I don't know if you know, you know the answer to this, but how, how has the world kind of decided that the US dollar is how things are measured? Yeah, I mean, well, with like not getting into kind of like the the history of it or anything, because a lot of people have opinions of, oh, the U.S. military forces the entire world to use it or something like that. The thing that I think is just important, though, from a from like an economic perspective is like, you know, the whatever the world currency or the predominant currency that's being used in trade happens to be. It's currently the dollar. Didn't always used to be the dollar, right? It used to be gold some other you know, time. But the point is, is that it's kind of like the SI unit of value, right? So like if you think of the, the you know, SI uh, units, like meters is for distance, you know, joules is for energy and stuff, right? Obviously, there's no SI unit for, for like money. But if you think about it, we all need one. Most people need one to be able to coherently communicate uh, value with, between each other, right? Imagine if I quoted you every price in, in like toasters, right? And I said, my laptop is worth about like 42 toasters, right? And then you said, well, my laptop is worth uh, two dryers, it, it would there would be impossible for people to actually it's you know to understand each other right you, we wouldn't even be speaking the same economic language right and right. so 
the thing about uh, kind of, you know, currency or the, the predominant world currency is everything is denominated in because it's a coordination mechanism for us to talk about value the same way that meters are a coordination mechanism for people to talk about distance, right? And, and all of the other types of units. So, um, and, and the question becomes, for example, like what's a good uh, unit, right? Is it something that's uh, going to significantly change your standard of living across time, right? Like, or, or is it actually something that is completely neutral to uh, the average person's standard of living. Again, like that's debatable, right? Like you can you can say like, well, is it ever possible to define you know a global standard of living for everyone, right? And and that's a good question to ask. But but that idea is is a very powerful idea, and and I think like most people just gloss over that. Most people just think like, mm-hmm. oh, the the dollar is just worth whatever it is. It's like. No, 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 there's there's actually some some thought put into like exactly the the purchasing power uh, of of this unit that we all use as kind of the SI unit of account. Right. Yeah. So so the U.S. dollars is definitely a unit of account that we all still need today. <laughs> I know we've been in the crypto um, community. I mean, for me, for three years now, and and yeah, I know. I, f- I feel like people kind of make. Uh, comments about the U.S. dollar, but it 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 is kind of a system that is still underpins a lot of uh, the way the global economy works today. Um, so, I mean, in a previous episode, we 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 touched on Bitcoin and how that might be a future form of money. Um, people call it, you know, digital gold or like you know the gold standard. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure about this. But where do you stand on um, Bitcoin? Yeah. So, so first of all, um, I I have Bitcoin. I think it's a good investment. I think it's very, uh, you know, revolutionary and stuff. But one of the first things that I uh, say is something we've talked about here is like. If I think it's a good investment, just my my own view of how I look at this stuff and kind of like why I'm also working in the stablecoin space, I think those two good investment and good currency are mutually exclusive, right? I think they're in conflict with each other in terms of like what I what I think a currency is supposed to be and what the currency actually is currently, right? And in the world in terms of the dollar, right? Um, so the the important thing to get at here is like most proponents, so most people that are uh, saying that, you know, Bitcoin is not only revolutionary new technology, but everything will be denominated. It'll be the currency of everything. In fact, the other day, uh, admittedly, um, El Salvador, you know, the, uh, you know, passed a, a full uh, law that basically made Bitcoin the national currency, uh, like the the U.S. dollar, which is accepted in uh, El Salvador. So that that's actually interesting. That's a counter argument to something that that I think uh, is that Bitcoin is is not a good currency. It's a good investment. Um, so my personal view is is that Bitcoin as as a stable unit of account. Is, is not possible. One of the main things people say is, well, as it gets bigger, it's going to be less uh, unstable. It's actually going to be more and more stable and predictable as the market cap gets bigger. Um, I think that the data actually shows that that's not correct. Um, last month in May, uh, Bitcoin had its most volatile month in its entire history. It went down by about 50% from its highs of 60 something thousand to into the 30s um and it's currently in the third high 30 thousands range um and that was bitcoin at over a trillion dollars of market cap right so so i've been in this space and like bitcoin had a couple billion and it's it's basically what is it like 500x to 1000x or something since i i got into this space and it's had uh yeah it's it's just had its negative 50 percent uh month 
right? Last month at over right. a trillion dollars a market. And, and we're speaking in May, 2021, just in case. Yes. <laughs> well, so, and, and that doesn't mean it's bad or it's a scam or anything, right? That I, I not only hold Bitcoin, but I also think, uh, you know, it's, it's something that will go up in value over the long term compared to the dollar, right? But the fact that we compare it to the dollar again is actually, uh, you know, um, it's actually evidence that it's it's not a good currency, right? Yeah. And and so a lot of we'll see, right? So so there's evidence to and for it, and it's difficult to say what's objectively right or wrong. Like El Salvador having Bitcoin as its national currency um, is a you know good evidence against against me, right? Against the stablecoin narrative, right? Against uh, that Bitcoin is a good investment, bad currency. Stable coins are good currencies, bad investments, right? Um, but it'll be interesting, right? And I'm, I'm very bullish Bitcoin as something to uh, make a lot of money on. Um, but I'm not bullish about the fact that, you know, they're like poor Laszlo is ever going to not get made fun of for spending, you know, 10,000 uh, Bitcoins on uh, two pizzas, I believe it was two. Right. Uh, it was, I think it was Domino's pizzas, something like that. Um, but like, you know, just uh, imagine people making fun of you for spending dollars on pizza. That that doesn't even make coherent sense, right? It's right. like, oh, you spent currency on something that's gonna be like like used for food, right? That doesn't even make any sense. Actually, you know, doesn't the opposite happen? You know, when like, when, when you know, my, my dad goes, oh, back in the day, this, you know, chicken rice was uh, only like, you know, $2 or something. This is, I mean, I'm talking about maybe in Malaysia. He'll be like, this chicken rice bowl was only $2. Now, because of inflation, it's worth more. And then with Bitcoin, it might, it's it's kind of opposite. Like this cost 10,000 Bitcoins, but now today it's, it's, I don't know, whatever people think, is it cheaper? Is it not, it's the same price? So no, that's really interesting about currency. And, you know, that the, the you know, about El Salvador making Bitcoin legal tender. I mean, yeah, like how do you think it will pan out? Because, yeah, you just spoke about the volatility and it, it seems that the more adoption uh, of Bitcoin, I mean, the it, it's kind of right now driving the price up, but then it's hard to tell. And, you know, obviously there's no central, there's no reserve bank, there's no... Um, you know, central authority to kind of go, all right, well, this is the price of a Bitcoin now. Um, yeah, how do you think it will pan out? Yeah, I mean, first of all, about the, the inflation thing. Um, yeah, I mean, right, like in the 1950s, right, like what a uh, hamburger was like 50 cents or something, right? It was like a dollar. Now, like a Big Mac's like six bucks, right? And um, there's two ways to, to look at it, right? Um, one thing is that you could say, you know, there, there shouldn't be any inflation or there should be some, but it, it's, this is too much. But the, first of all, the reason why the, the Federal Reserve even targets any amount of inflation uh, is that the government doesn't want people to just hoard and hold cash because that would slow down economic growth. They actually want cash to go somewhere that has productive use, either consume something with it or uh, invest it, right? Or put it to some kind of productive use. Now, that idea alone isn't wrong. I actually I actually kind of agree with that, right? But but to a certain extent, right? And so like the then there's an argument about how much, right? Is is two and a half percent inflation per year, which is the target. Is that too much, right? Because if you if you actually take a dollar and then you add 2.5% inflation to it for over 50 years, uh, you actually get way more than six dollars. But recall that you actually track the consumer price index, right? So then uh, even though it's going to be inflated by way more than you know, five or six X over 50 years, the, the price of meat processing and creating bread and all of this stuff is getting cheaper over time as well because of technological uh, improvements, right? So you get something where it's like, if you compound 2.5% over 50 years, then hamburger should really be actually like $80. 
right? Or something like that, right? Compounded uh, interest or inflation is, is a lot, right? However, it's only 6X is expensive because the price of making a hamburger is actually also getting cheaper across time, right? Um, just because of technology, right? Same thing with electronics, right? Like we all know that a a uh, computer that has like, you know, that had one megabyte of RAM in 1995 or something uh, was was like a thousand dollars, right? It was like the bleeding edge, like computer model of, of the day. But now uh, you have a $1,000 laptop that has like 64 gigabit RAM or something, right? 32 gigabits. That's like 10,000 times this as powerful overall, right? With with better CPU, graphics card, RAM, and everything. And it's the same price. It's a thousand dollars, right? Thousand dollars and a thousand dollars will buy you something that's a thousand times or more more powerful than than 20 years ago, right? People forget about that, part, right? The whole point is the dollar is supposed to be pegged to those things, not to some some units, right? Like. Like, uh, if you think about it, it's supposed to make consuming the things that keep your standard of living the same, uh, relatively stable plus 2.5% 2, 2 inflation. So that, that's kind of, it, it's interesting because the intent isn't to, you know, have a hamburger be worth a dollar in units, right? Like one unit of a dollar in 1950, as in like 2020, um, but it's supposed to make your so so let's actually translate this let's say you're a person that like eats five hamburgers a week or something in 1950 right and you you know make a minimum wage so to mm -hmm. speak whatever it happens to be back then right um if you also make minimum wage uh today 2020 you should, in theory, be able to also eat five hamburgers per week without basically uh, not being able to afford it, without being able to like actually uh, go into debt or anything, right? Without cutting into your savings anymore. That's the goal. That that's the point. And they might not be doing a good job. They might be doing a great job. Actually, I don't know, right? But but that's the actual intent, right? The intent isn't to make the U.S. dollar some kind of like incredible investment asset right like like to if you if you hold it across 1950 to 2020 you should be rich you should be able to like buy like mansions and and things like that or something right but like for example if you held apple stock in in like uh early in the 70s or something when steve jobs and wozniak founded apple right you would be insanely rich right you'd be disgustingly rich right now Mm -hmm. Right. But if you had held dollars, your standard of living shouldn't change minus uh, 2.5 percent inflation per year. That is a really good illustration. And I think people don't talk enough about that part, um, about the the function and the need for, yeah, the U.S. dollar. Um, and and coming back to the point about stability, uh, you're right. You, you You hope that the person who. Yeah, a person who works minimum wage could still afford their food, rent, um, and that's the whole point of it. Um, and yeah, I'm not so sure Bitcoin uh, solves that part. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, the, the thing is, like, so, so in the other side of of, of the Bitcoiners' defense, and like, you know, the hard money people, right, like gold and and all these things, um, their view is that the way that the dollar is being inflated does not actually um, keep someone's standard of living the same. And so actually, it, obviously, this is a debate, right? Um, the, For example, um, people say that the consumer price index is like deliberately manipulated. For example, uh, real estate home prices are, are not in the consumer price index, but rental prices are. Um, there's a reasoning for this, right? The federal government says, well, the, the consumptive asset of a home is, is to live in it. Um, and, and then they see real estate as an investment. But but that, that, that's, again, it's like a political discussion, right? But like the, the counter argument is like the consumer price index doesn't do a good job. It's, it's actually outdated. It's, uh, it's politically manipulated, right? If the price of homes is, is going too high, they'll like exclude it just to make sure that like uh, it doesn't, you know, show uh, 
the, the weakening of the U.S. dollar, right? Um, there's some truth to that, and there's also some, you know, it's, it's a debate, right? Um, personally, for example, the thing that I find the most um, kind of lacking in the CPI that I think there's no good reason and that I would agree with like Bitcoiners and, and like uh, the hard money people is like the cost of college education in the United States is not in the CPI, but in order for you to even be able to get any kind of like uh, middle-class job or income, a college education is essentially required. Um, and the, the cost of college education is far outpacing the CPI. So like, for example, um, people have to go into crushing debt these days, right? Just to get a college degree so that they can qualify for uh, the, the average wage, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not accounted for, right? That's like they, so, so what the argument is like college, a college degree is not a consumptive good. Okay, sure, technically that's true, right? But, but then you, you actually completely miss a, a common fact of, of life in, in the United States, which is you need a post-secondary education to actually be able to even earn enough dollars to be able to do any of this stuff, right? And so, um, so that, that's something that I think uh, there's a real debate. It's not like um, it's not like it's very obvious that the, that the CPI and how the dollar's monetary policy is being conducted is uh, incredibly good and, and perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talk, talked about Bitcoin and how there are people of the view that, you know, one day or we should head into a world where Bitcoin uh, the world is, or, or items are denominated in Bitcoin. Um, and then we've talked about, you know, how currency is meant to be stable. Um, and so one of the solutions to this is stable coins um, as, as an in-between, I guess. Um, and you're the founder of uh, Frax, a stable coin. Um, and before we get into that, um, could you explain in, in an easy to understand way what is a stable coin. Yeah, so um, the cool thing is it's in the name, right? So so a stable coin is uh, an on-chain uh, cryptocurrency token that's uh, meant to be price stable. So it's meant to either follow some uh, peg. Um, and recently, actually, they, they actually don't follow uh, outside pegs, but we can, we can get into that. But so for example, most stable coins are pegged to the dollar. One token is just $1. Those are the predominant stable coins. There's some that are euros or, or other things, but just like how everyone uses the dollar, most uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and people and stuff also use uh, dollar denominated stable coins. So the most right. you know famous ones, Tether, USDC, Frax is, is one that uh, we started. It is pegged to the US dollar. Um, we have over a hundred million dollars uh, worth of uh, Frax on chain um, being used. So uh, so yeah, I mean it's it's exactly the opposite of uh, of the other cryptocurrencies in that. It's not an investment. You don't actually hold Frax if you want to get uh, get rich. And it's interesting here because actually, if, if we think about it, the cryptocurrency market today, even when we talk about the price of Bitcoin, we talk about the price of Bitcoin denominated in US dollars. And then now you, you, you've just um, explained stable coins are still a lot of them are still pegged to the US dollar. So there's a common theme here. The world's still denominated. I mean, a lot of the world's transactions, trade, money, still denominated in US dollars. Okay, so so you're saying there's there's a lot of stable coins right now that are pegged to the US dollars. What are some names of, of the most popular stable The biggest coins? one is Tether, which was like one of the first stable coins. Uh, these are kind USDT. of- USDT, USDT. Yes, yes. And then the second biggest one is USDC, which is actually uh, Coinbase and Circle's uh, stablecoin. And so these two actually are uh, called fiat coins because they're actually the, the way that the tokens are, are uh, pegged to the US dollar is that there's a regulated bank account of the company that has them. So for USDC, it's Coinbase and Circle. And they essentially back one stable coin by one dollar in, in a bank account. So of course the token is going to be worth a dollar because you can come and redeem it for one, right? Um, 
there's decentralized stable coins like Frax, uh, like DAI, which is uh, from the protocol called MakerDAO. Um, these are actually kind of uh, unique because they're fully on the blockchain, every aspect of them. Uh, the collateral is on the blockchain, so you can actually redeem the stable coin for value on chain. There's no bank account or, or anything like that. And the most unique part about some of these, uh, including Frax, including DAI, is that you can actually invest in the system because there's a second token usually. So with Frax, it's called Frax Shares, uh, FXS. Um, with Maker, it's called MKR, which is uh, MakerDAO's token. Um, and holding these tokens, those tokens are meant to be an investment. The price of those tokens goes up or down based on how much uh, those stable coins are being used. Like either fees go to those uh, second tokens or uh, they're used in different ways. Um, but those are volatile against the price of the dollar, right? Um, and so those are the you know newer kind of stable coins which are fully on chain. Um, and those are really exciting. So let me do a little bit of a recap. So you've just explained a stable coin that is, um, so, 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 so they're pegged, so pegged is to the US dollar, and then what they're back, so what's behind it, so what's behind USDC is, like you said, actual um, dollars in a bank account that Coinbase and Circle manage. So they make sure that, say, if they have a billion dollars in the bank, then they issue a billion dollars worth of USDC. Um, but ultimately, uh, Circle and Coinbase manage that supply. Is that fair to say? Okay, so they manage that, and they're kind of, well, what we'll call the central organization. And, you know, uh, if, if anything happens, we can kind of go to them and be like, hey, where's my USDC? Um, and then you've explained decentralized stable coins. Uh, and if I'm not wrong, there's no one, there's no um, organization per se um, managing the supply. Yeah, so it. those those are on the blockchain and they use smart contracts to lock up uh, funds. So for example, uh, with, with DAI, there's, um, let's say there's a thousand DAI in circulation and they're each supposed to be a dollar. There's actually... Um, a bunch of cryptocurrency that's uh, worth over $1,000 uh, locked up. And the DAI is essentially able to be redeemed or backed, so to speak, uh, by that like pile of cryptocurrency in a smart contract. Now, again, cryptocurrencies are really unstable, right, against the US dollar. So whenever MakerDAO generates DAI, they have to put up more than $1 worth of cryptocurrency for each DAI in order for it to be worth a dollar. But what's cool about this is that everything is on the blockchain, right? Like no one can shut down uh, the smart contracts that, that manage MakerDAO, but people can go to Circle, for example, or Coinbase and say, um, stop issuing USDC, right? Stop giving people dollars uh, when they come in you know, trying to redeem their USDC. And then that's, you know, that's basically just a bank, right? The cool thing about, you know, Bitcoin and all of this other stuff is it's totally disjoint from any of the classical financial system entirely. And the cool thing about these on-chain stable coins like DAI, like Frax, and all of these things is they're also fully on the blockchain and have nothing to do with uh, dollars and bank accounts and stuff. Right. Um, and so right now, I mean, so right now, how many, how much frax is there? So the right now, as of right this moment, uh, I believe there's about $120 million worth of frax in circulation. And so, but then, so you're saying there is more than $120 in cryptocurrencies to make sure that there's enough to go around, right? So typically, uh, before Frax launched, the idea uh, behind stablecoins on the blockchain was that there'd have to be more cryptocurrency uh, backing it. But the, the unique value proposition of Frax and our kind of like very one of a kind unique design is that Frax is actually the first fractional reserve stablecoin, uh, which basically means that, you know, kind of like 
a classical bank, but completely decentralized and on the blockchain, uh, Frax isn't fully backed. So that, for example, for um, 120 million Frax, there is only 100 million dollars worth of cryptocurrency, for example, in the reserve. Everyone can still come and redeem their Frax for a dollar of value, but there isn't one-to-one -one backing. And so usually the next question becomes, okay, what happens if there's a bank run, right? What happens if all 120 million people want to come uh, redeem their Frax or something, but there's only 100 million, right? Like you, you've just created the classical uh, fractional reserve bank, right? The cool thing about Frax's design is it uses kind of on-chain smart contracts and algorithms that as soon as people uh, are trying to redeem a lot of Frax stable coins, it actually mints the second token, right? The thing we talked about that's uh, the investment asset, the Frax share. And it uses that to immediately buy uh, cryptocurrency on the blockchain and fill the reserve to keep it from running out. So that the, the cool thing about this design is like, it has an anti-bank run mechanism in the sense that um, there's no way that like the last people uh, can be held like holding a useless, you know, unbacked token. But what's really cool about it is it's more capital efficient than any other stable coin because unless you need to have the extra backing, um, it's not fully backed. So you can actually print money uh, as much as kind of the blockchain needs uh, dollars, right? Because because Frax is dollars. So you you print it out uh, with the algorithm, right? With the actual smart contracts, but it's not fully backed, um, but it's still redeemable for a dollar. Anyone can come and get a dollar worth of cryptocurrency out of the, the Frax system. Um, and because it's, you know, fractional, uh, that's actually where it gets its name, Frax, fractional currency. Um, then as soon as there might be a situation where there's a lot of people trying to, uh, you know, get out of Frax or redeem it, um, the, the reserve, the fractionality actually increases all the way up to 100% if necessary for, for it to just back the entire thing. But the fact that it can do that, right, the fact that it can actually robustly uh, do that programmatically and everyone can see that it can do that. And everyone sees that it's done that before, if necessary, right? Um, this has already happened a bunch of times. Um, and people see it, people know that it's never broken its uh, peg. So Frax is actually uh, never broken its $1 peg. Um, that actually just instills confidence and you actually just don't need the, uh, the, the full backing, right? And so one thing that's really cool that we've invented is like, we've invented for the first time kind of a stable coin uh, on the blockchain that is not one-to-one -one backed and no one's done that before. So that's pretty cool. Right. Thank you so much for explaining that. It just sounds like there's a lot of math behind it all. Um, and, um, but when, when, when you talk about um, how you can print money, um, I'd say some people would be kind of concerned about that because they'd be go, well, then couldn't you guys just print more money if you wanted you know, to take out 5 million, you just print it and then you take it out. Like what's, um, are, are people able to do that or is there a mechanism that stops? So that? The, the whole point with, with Frax currently is that it's, it's pegged to the dollar, right? And so what's interesting is all of the smart contracts and on-chain algorithms only uh, do things if the price uh, is a dollar. So like we can't just like mint a bunch of Frax and like, you know, print a bunch of money and then make it worthless, right? Like, like just basically uh, do a bunch of stuff that would break the entire system. And th that's actually why blockchain, you know, tech is really important because people can see the code. They can see like, okay, this is actually decentralized. They, the people who made this don't just have the key that anytime they can come and just like print a bunch of uh, money. They, this only uh, works because the peg is exactly a dollar 
And whatever the peg needs to be to stay at a dollar is the actual amount of fracks that's circulating. And no one else can change that. No one, like I can't go and increase the, the supply of fracks to make the price go down, or I can't decrease the supply of, of fracks to make the price go up to like two, three, four, or five dollars or something. So um we can only uh actually just see the the protocol, you know, function according to the smart contracts, basically. Right. Um, so just to kind of summarize everything. So we've, we've kind of touched on, um, you know, currency, how, um, it's, it's meant to be stable. And now, you know, um, uh, we, 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 we've, we've just spoken about fracks and how it's kind of the, 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 the interim maybe potential solution as a stable coin. Cause it's not like, you know, um, managed or or owned or run by a central organization i know you guys are behind this but it kind of is going to like it will grow on its own is that fair to say yeah and, and it's fully uh on chain and so that's the main difference between for example uh frax and and uh die um versus the other ones we talked about like Tether and, and USCC, which uh, are actually just uh, tokens from banks, basically. Yeah, yeah. And so to to wrap up, you know, what what, what do you think, um, you know, it's going to take for um, the world, or um, you know, people today, the average person on the street, our moms, dads, to to adopt stable coins. Yeah. So, I mean, in a certain sense, you could probably already say that like people adopt and already use stable coins as currency more than Bitcoin, uh, right? Because because most of them are pegged to the dollar. Uh, stable coin usage has actually, uh, you know, expanded year over year. Um, so one topic that's kind of really interesting that we're also doing research on at, at Frax is the, the newest types of stable coins, including uh, what we're doing uh, at Frax is that we're actually going further than just kind of pegging to the dollar and asking, well, if we peg Frax to the dollar and the dollar is pegged to the CPI or some basket of uh, consumptive goods, aren't we basically, you know, transitively basically pegging Frax to the CPI? What if we actually create our own or, or better version of, of a CPI, right? Like we make this again uh, from the ground up um, on the blockchain, right? Like a crypto native uh, version of the consumer price index. And so what's actually interesting is one thing we're doing research on, which is part of our long-term goal is to uh, release this thing called the FRAX price index, so the FPI. And the, and the point of that is uh, to eventually um, actually just peg frax directly to that um it's not in in any time happening uh soon frax will be still pegged to uh the dollar but i think that it's it's really important research and it's actually where uh decentralized stable coins are going because the the goal is to essentially create stability on the blockchain in a decentralized manner without having to rely on you know the us government or uh pegging to the dollar right and so what makes the dollar really useful, you know, other than the fact that everyone already uses it and stuff, but what makes it even more useful than kind of gold or, or anything else is that it does keep your standard of living relatively uh, equal, you know, plus minus 2%, right, the inflation mm -hmm. rate. So that problem actually, I think, can be solved in a decentralized manner with stable coins uh, going forward. But we're still, I think, a few years out from that. But that is also uh, one of the big, you know, kind of ultimate challenges that uh, Frax and I think other leading stable coin projects are, are looking to solve. Awesome. Well, Sam, that is a really interesting research that you guys are attempting. And I think that is um, a great way to kind of end, end, end the show for now. And for, for those who are interested in Sam's work, do follow him on Twitter. Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing what Frax is going to achieve in the coming months and years. Thank you so much for having me on, Sven. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us on Yavcast. If you're new to this channel, we'd love for you to subscribe and click the bell to be notified of future episodes. I'm Samantha Yap. Thanks for joining me on the story of money by Yapcast.